All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Agile Release Management Best Practices for the Salesforce Admin. My name is Tori Beeler. I'm going to be your MC, your moderator, your host, all of that today. Um, we're going to give everyone just a few minutes to kind of get in, log in, get settled, all that stuff before we get started. So thank you guys all for joining and we'll we'll continue on in just a few minutes. Give everyone just another 30 seconds or so to join. We had mm -hmm. hundreds of people register for today's session, which is really exciting for us at Prodly. Um, so we will, we're waiting for just a few more and then we'll get going. Nice. All right, wonderful. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. So thank you again for joining us today for our Agile Release Management Best Practices for the Salesforce Admin. Um, before we get really started, I just want to cover some housekeeping. Um, real quick, this is, uh, you guys are all in mute right now. You shouldn't be able to speak. You're, the way that you're going to be communicating with us is going to be through your questions tab. So as you see from this picture here, you should be seeing our beautiful faces up top, the slides on bottom, and you should have a questions tab on the other side near your dashboard. Now, just to make sure that you guys can hear us okay, that everything is working properly, I want you to go in and let us know where you are in the world, how you're doing on this Tuesday. I'm in Colorado Springs, Colorado. It's like 70 degrees outside. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, just let us know where you're at, just so that we know that these questions are working. We'll wait a couple minutes for you guys to start putting those in. Detroit. Walla -walla. Nice. Welcome, Nancy, Deba. I hope I said that right. Welcome, everyone. Walla Walla, Washington. I'm not sure what that is. Deba. Sorry, thank you. Luke, welcome from the UK. Always like to have people on that side of the pond. Mm -hmm. Welcome, everyone, Rockford. Nice picture, Susie, thank you. <laughs> Susie is our Director of Partner Alliances. She was a part of that photo. Um, that picture is actually our practice mode, so we look much better now. <laughs> Great, welcome everyone. So it sounds seems like everyone knows how our chat works. That's how you'll be communicating with us. Um, before we get started, the other thing we'll be doing today on this session is be taking a few polls throughout this uh, webinar. So. I'm gonna go ahead and launch this first one. It's just something really simple. We wanna know how you guys are doing right now, how you're staying sane during this practice of social distancing. Some of you may be shelter in place currently. We understand it can be really hard. Um, I know a lot of people are either keeping their routine as normal as possible. They're just trying to stay sane. It seems like it's a very popular answer here. I know one thing that I'm doing is making a lot of poor shopping choices. I've bought uh, a lot of art supplies knowing well, knowing knowing that I'm not at all an artist or have any talent in that whatsoever. I also happen to buy a guitar, which I have no intention of playing. So <laughs> that's how I'm staying sane. Uh, Steven, what are you doing? I actually have a guitar right there. So I'll, I'll break it out. We, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Great. It seems like most people are just keeping normal. So I'm going to close and share. Yeah. As you guys can see, everyone's just trying to keep the routine as normal as possible. The yeah. next best answer is definitely just staying sane. Staying sane. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now that you guys know how that works, we're going to be taking a few more throughout the, the webinar today. Um, our next one is our instructor. So I'm very excited to be introducing our instructor for today's presentation, Stephen Crane. Now, Steven is an experienced product manager who has led and delivered a plethora of <laughs> concept to launch software introductions for mid and enterprise sized companies. He has been the quarterback, the coach, the cheerleader, whatever position you have for company wide product launches and Salesforce CPQ projects. He is an absolute champion in everything release management, and there is no one better be to be doing this presentation today. So with that, Steven, I'm going to pass it off to you. I'm going to get off camera. I'm still here in the background for all of you guys, um, but I'm going to leave it to Steven. Thanks, Tori. All right, guys, you can still see the screen. 
Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Super excited to have you on, um, you know, doing during these these crazy times. We want to make this, um, you know, instructional. We want to make it fun for you. Um, we're, we're just super happy to for you to for you guys to be on with us. Um, so I'll, I'll set the stage here as to the presentation, um, not to be too formal about it, but we're going to be talking about agile release management um, in a software development context but more importantly, how it applies to you, right? The reason why we're here is how can you take and adopt some of these practices um, led traditionally by software houses, uh, internal development teams and start applying them to your daily workflows, right? So you can deliver more value to your business and, and your customers. Um, now, I, for those of you who um, are new with us here at Prodly, just so you guys know, we're, we're hyper-focused on developing uh, software solutions that equip admins, primarily admins, with the right tools for them to build, manage, and deploy data on the Salesforce platform. Um, if you're an admin, you know, in any role, um, and you're responsible for deploying data uh, to a production environment, just understand how important your role is in, in your overall release management game. Um, and if you don't have, have a game yet, hopefully you get some takeaways from from this webinar and um, you can go back to your business and, and start uh, uh, start implementing um, and making some of this this useful. So so we'll walk you guys through overall what release management is, some objectives, how to get started, um, and some of the the practices around using an agile agile framework. That sound good? Um, we'll we'll jump in. So let's talk about release uh, management in an agile framework. So by definition, release management is the process of planning, scheduling, and deploying a software, a build or a version of software through its various development stages and through the various environments. So typically, an engineering or a DevOps team would stage up the environments as such. You'd have a, a dev box where the developers build. You'd have a QA box where the QA team does full performance and regression testing a staging environment that mirrors closely to a production environment, it's more stable. Um, and then your production environment, of course, is the environment that your live customers are actually using uh, to access and use your software. Then the, the deployment of the software to the production environment is what we call a release. Um, you can see the release management cycle is, is highly involved. That definition doesn't do it complete justice, right? Because in practice, it takes a lot of work a lot of teamwork, a lot of collaboration, and, and a good amount of rigor to execute and implement successfully. And then even still, there's always lessons that you can learn from past releases and implement and, and future releases. Um, so the release management cycle is such that begins with an intake process, usually a product owner, triaging requirements that you get from the client. This could also apply to projects as well, not just ongoing uh, development, the projects that have a start and end. So the intake of product requirements, um, the, um, the building of those actual requirements into stories, small little building blocks, the prioritization of those stories into a software cadence or a sprint uh, cycle, um, and then the handoff to the development team, which takes it through the iterations um, and the push of the various environments we just talked about. So ultimately that software can get into the hands, hands of the customer. Um, so it's a broad process. A release manager or coordinator is a role in a company, um, and, and it's an evolving practice that many companies are implementing, um, and it continues to evolve, especially on the Salesforce platform, which we'll talk about. One mechanism that takes it, or one concept that takes this, uh, this premise of you know, methodical deployments in this release structure a step further is the concept of source control, which any or version control, which any software and engineering team wouldn't wouldn't implement code or develop code without without it, right? And that's the concept of managing changes to code um, by managing different versions of uh, that developers can use to branch off a mainline um, so they can build and test iteratively before pushing it back into to the mainline. Um, so that software can be routinely tested before it gets into the production environment. Um, so what is so so what does all this really mean in, in context? Um, it, it takes a lot of work to to manage and and put these building blocks in place to effectively uh, maintain a release management practice in house. So there are frameworks that you can use, and Agile is one of them um, to help implement. Now there's other methodologies you could employ, um, you know Kanban, 
some hybrid models that we're actually looking, you know, Scrum Bond, uh, but they're all really derived from this, this concept of Agile. So the Agile Manifesto, um, I'll give you guys some, uh, uh, some breakdown is um, breaking down work into small chunks. So traditionally you'd have, you know, a business analyst or a product owner develop some large spec, right? A PRD, hand it off to a developer and then, you know, plan out the next six to eight months of develop, development. Well, we know that doesn't work well in today's economic environment and with changing technologies, right? Things are too fast paced. Things change too, too frequently. Um, so agile is the method by which taking large bodies of work, making them much more smaller, breaking them down into what we call stories, right? In the backlog. Um, so that a business analyst or a product owner can assess those, prioritize them, and then plan them out for the next part of uh, uh, what we're going to cover on the Agile um, kind of framework. And that's the idea of breaking works down in uh, um, development timelines into sprints. So um, typically one to four time boxed windows where the team is actually building and testing um, if you're at the one week mark, man, you're really cranking and four weeks tends to stretch it a bit. So two weeks typically is what we see companies using. And that's the period of time where the development team is heads down, they're doing their work, they're building and they're testing iteratively, which is the third point in the, in the Agile kind of manifesto is iterative QA, right? Because you're developing and building in such small building blocks and not waiting till the end of the cycle to do this complete, you know, full scope testing, um, you can iteratively test as you build. And with source control and version control, you can do that much more easily, much quicker. Um, so QA is inherently built into the overall process, which means you're gonna be delivering a higher quality product to, to your end client. Um, so there's a couple core key objectives um, I wanna cover on Agile. They're not listed on the slide here, but I'll just talk to them. I've distilled them down to, I mean, there's many, right? Different companies take the, these, these, these concepts and um, adapt them, right, as to what works for the particular business and the, um, the industry that they're in. But I've distilled them down into three core tenets, I think, are um, uh, just based on my own experience and what I've observed. Um, number one we talked about is to deliver value to end users as fast as possible and with the highest quality in a repeatable fashion. Number two is ensuring that clients requirements are met. You wanna make sure you're delivering for your customers. Um, so when you do release code, you're delivering that code with the you know, minimum number of regressions, if not any regressions uh, introduced into the production environment. And you're delivering on the original specs that your customer gave you. Um, so you're meeting their, their needs and their requirements. Um, and three, taking steps to ensure that the applications are successfully deployed without compromising the integrity of the production environment. Key, 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 right? Production goes down then, then supports getting phone calls and, um, and that's just a fire for, for everybody. Um, all right, so we're moving on to the next slide here. Now, what does this mean for you? Um, and, and the reason why we're all here is we talk about how you can adopt these um, methodologies traditionally used by software and DevOps teams into your daily workflow. And that's exactly what we're seeing, is they can be adapted and adopted into teams outside of development. These are your IT teams. These are your teams responsible for agile in-house um, development, building custom apps, and for building and maintaining internal tools, which are arguably as business critical, mission critical for the lifeblood of your business to function um, as the end user using the software that the development team is using. Right, so your role as an admin becomes super critical. Salesforce, of course, gives you the tools to be able to do that all declaratively using clicks, not code. But you also have your teammates and other departments that are actually coding, right, and building more custom custom apps within the Salesforce platform. Um, so it's even more important than that you remain agile because you can make changes so quick in Salesforce. And because the demands are so high and because you've got business requirements coming from all sorts of you know, different, um, in fact, that would be interesting. Type of one or um, just, is this resonating with you? I remember when I was an admin and um, you know, we were maintaining a backlog of, of business requirements internally. Requirements come from everywhere. I mean, from marketing, from, from sales, 
um, from the product management team, right? Your backlog is big, just as a development backlog is, is big, right? So you need some framework and structure to help organize your workflows and optimize things for you so that you can develop and continually iterate and deliver value to, to your business. So business agility, key, key, key. And then the other important topic here is, is governance, right? So what we have are these two opposing forces that we see is your business is telling you go faster, faster, faster. You've got a growing backlog of requirements, but then you've got a compliance and a governance uh, you know, a change management board, right? That's telling you, whoa, let's slow down, right? Let's make sure we put this through the paces and get the proper sign-offs. So you're going to need the right tools, um, which we'll describe at a later time in the presentation for you to help you accomplish accomplish your goals. Um, so is this is this resonating with you guys? Uh, type a one in if it is, um, and uh, and let's go on to we can we can do a poll here. Let's see. Okay, we just launched a poll. Um, Okay, cool. Yeah, so your roles here. So we have 33% uh, of you are admins, 38% of you are project and program managers. That's awesome. 5% product managers and 14% developers. All right, awesome. Cool. That's great. Let's launch another poll here. Um, we want to know if this is resonating with you. We want to understand if, if, if you have, uh, if the companies you work for have a release management strategy already in place. Um, or maybe if you're in the early stages of uh, of developing one. Nice. Okay. We have the questions coming in here. I'll wait for them to finish and we'll and then I'll read them off for everybody. Oh, it's still going. Looks like maybe it's. All right, we'll give it a few more seconds. 69% voted. All right, cool. Uh, the poll closed? All right, I think it's closed. All right, so we have, do you want to read them off, Tori, or do you want me to? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, I closed the poll. It's currently, all the results are shown to them. Uh, you can go oh. ahead and read them out if you'd like. All right, cool. They can see them. So 26% of you say, yes, we follow best practice guidelines. Okay, awesome. Um, we'd be interested in hearing what those what those are for you. 65%, uh, yes, we have some processes in place, okay. 6%, no, we don't have a process, okay. And uh, so 0%, no, I wasn't sure that we needed one. 3%, I'm not sure if my company has a release, um, release management practice. All right, cool. So this is, um, so this is hopefully uh, in line with what you guys are, um, what you guys are working towards. That's, that's great to see. All right, go on to the next slide here. So segueing in now to the benefits of adopting an agile framework, right? Admins need to remain agile. They need to be able to manage their workloads and deliver fast for the businesses while making sure that things are staying compliant. Um, so in general, the, the, the benefits of the agile methodology translate well to uh, performing work and delivering on the Salesforce platform, right? So we have one of the core benefits as we talked about is more frequent and smaller product releases. If you're working in two week blocks, maybe even shorter blocks, that means you're delivering something at the end of each iteration. Now, if you look at this diagram, you say, oh, okay, if I haven't implemented this process already, this looks like it's creating more work, right? I'm just gonna go and make changes in production and then I'm gonna be done. But Implementing this process, like we see with any implementations of process, might take a little bit of time up front. So, you know, you'll see a down spike in velocity, but eventually you'll see economies of scale. Once you start revving this engine, it starts to really work um, and helps you optimize the way in work to which your team or your admins are triaging work, focusing on what they need to do, and then delivering that work. So you're always delivering something, you're always delivering value. Now, this process iterates. Um, so you could be delivering something and deploying a build to production at the end of two weeks, or if you're working on a much larger scale, that could be, you know, several sprints worth of work and you're planning a release out, you know, at the end of maybe two, three, four sprints. Um, so the iterative nature is definitely a benefit um, uh, of the Agile methodology. Shorter response times and changes in requirements and or priorities. So 
doing things declaratively on the Salesforce platform, of course, being able to do it with clicks, not code, um, means you can change uh, or you can adapt to changing requirements very quickly, right? And that's what we see on the product development side too, is um, changes to requirements. We actually have to reassess, you know, mid sprint, uh, re course correct, and then, and then plan ahead for, for the next sprint. Um, reduction of post production support due to inherent quality assurance. So we talked about that one already because you're performing testing, you know, in a dev org, um, you know, configuring, making sure things check out, everything's working, workflows are intact, the expected results, field records are being generated. Um, you're actually testing as you go and doing that iteratively means that when you deploy to production, the goal and you know, the end goal is to um, minimize, minimize issues that happen in production. So resulting in fewer defects um, and reduce costs. So I don't know if anyone here has, um, is anyone here in the middle of implementing a big, a big project like like CPQ or um, you know FSL or B2B or uh, is just working on a major process you know a project right now um, your, your business wants to see the ROI on that project pretty quickly doesn't it uh, and I remember when I was an admin having contact we were switching over to uh, Steelbrick CPQ that was that was the goal right we had to make sure we had everything planned out uh, once we rolled it out to sales, the business wanted to see an ROI very quickly as to, you know, our go-to-market, right? We could launch products much more quicker. We didn't have to wait to programmatically build in the SKUs and the big machines. We could just do it all, all through Salesforce and reps could get quotes out quicker. Um, so if that resonates with people. That's that's one of the core, core benefits that Agile helps provide. Um, okay, we're going to go into some uh, best practices here and... Um, and just some rough do's and don'ts. Um, so I think we got each one populating. Like, here we go. Cool. All right. So how many in the audience actually have a, um, so you said you, you're following uh, some traditional practices. So you've set up your, your sandbox infrastructure to scale, right, per Salesforce guidelines. So you set up a, you have a dev box that your developers are devving in, uh, sandbox, maybe your admins are working in, uh, QA, UAT uh, boxes, uh, orgs, um, and then eventually a production org. Um, let's, maybe I kind of hit the, the other one, she's kind of jumped onto the screen there. <laughs> um, uh, so that that is, that is a key. Um, similar to a software team that would uh, stage up the environments, right, to isolate and control the build before it's promoted up to the next next highest uh, environment, you do the same thing on Salesforce. Um, Salesforce has great resources too on on recommendations on like the application life cycle, um, how to how to uh, organize your org structure uh, to fit each of those. Um, to fit the end goals that you're doing in each of those orgs and, and then be aware of each org storage limits and, and cost, right? Because we all know sandboxes are expensive. Um, so the second point here is treat configuration data with the same rigor as metadata and code. So this is an interesting one because the literature on release management um, that's being promoted on the Salesforce platform that's still growing and evolving is very much centered around metadata management, right, around the objects, um, you know, settings, uh, and any in-house custom app development that you're doing, right? It's code. So you still need to build in an org and then push out to the different orgs um, to make sure you're minimizing defects um, before you release your app in, in production. Um, but many apps on Salesforce are declaratively configured and the data is not actually stored as metadata, it's stored as record data. We call that reference data, it's configuration data. If anyone here is um, users of CPQ, you know this very well. Um, you know, product rules, price rules, all the business logic that would be stored in code, like traditionally is actually stored as uh, record data. So as such, it needs to be treated with the same rigor as metadata, and you need the tools to be able to deploy that data from an environment to the next, to the next, to the next. So you can ensure you're releasing um, successfully. Um, three, consider using a version control system as your source of truth for change management. Has anyone here, uh, I'll throw out a question to the audience. Um, should have made a poll for this, but 
and just out of curiosity, who's using uh, source control right now or version control? And just curious what, what you're using. Um, are you using Git um, and you know Salesforce you know, CLI tools? Um, are you using a, a, a VCS system like a GitHub or a Bitbucket? Um, GitLab, another common one. I'd be very interested in knowing what, what you guys are what you guys are using. Um, but the general premise is, as we talked about before, is you know there really is no you can't put structure around a release management process without having a source of truth. Using version control as the source of truth is is key, and and the emerging uh, the emerging trend. This is where it's headed. Um, uh, now you're also going to need tools for um, helping you as you deploy data. Also make sure you're tracking changes right and versioning data, uh, so you can stay compliant and you can meet the the business requirements of your auditors. Um, and so here at Prodly, we're working on tools um, around reference database version control uh, integration solutions that that will help you help you do that. Um, so you need a rollback strategy as well. So this also plays into what a version control system can provide. Um, anything goes wrong in production, you know that could be detrimental. <laughs> uh, if a product rule or a price rule, you know, is not implemented correctly, or if anything is missing at the time of deployment, you go live, you know, that can create, well, I mean, just just ramifications, right? Downstream ramifications. You got typically with like a CPQ implementation, you've got billing integrations, you got downstream ERP systems that are that are actually using the data that actually is is um, captured in those records. So if a price rule malfunctions, you're not calculating the right pricing, anything goes down in a quarter, you can't get quotes out, it slows business down. And we all know we can't slow business down. Um, so you need a rollback strategy to protect your production org and roll it back to the last known state, right? Much like a developer would roll back and capture the last known state, the working state, um, and then promote that back up to minimize the, the impact in, in production. Let's go on to five. Consider adopting an Agile framework to release more frequently. So we talked about this. Um, doesn't have to be an Agile framework. And you know, Agile, you can call it whatever you want, but a framework that helps you deliver um, more iteratively so, so you can deliver value to your business, business faster. So the recommendation is to, to break out your workloads and some sort of a cadence um, sprints. Um, so it's much more easier for your admins to focus and, and, and build and then, and then release at the end of each, each cycle. Routinely testing through the configuration lifecycle, yes. Um, that's also key, a key component of, of Agile, like we discussed, but also um, something you can do within Salesforce as well as you're building uh, declaratively, um, making sure that what you build is checking out, right? So that's testing happy path, but also testing, you know, negative testing. What else might be breaking downstream if you have workflow rules or anything that's referencing other, other fields that you've, you've built? Um, so having a testing plan in place to make sure you know which steps to go through to actually backtrace things that um, uh, that could potentially break and having acceptance criteria written out for, for requirements is going to be key. Um, and we do have a checklist at the end of this uh, to kind of help you guys kind of you know, get started and think through um, and maybe provide you some more ideas as how you can capture uh, you know, requirements and testing requirements and um, hopefully that's helpful. Um, building a culture of collaboration and inviting others to participate in release reviews, that's key. Um, making it fun, right? Especially now, like in this remote virtual day and age. It probably were a remote culture, so we know what it's we know what it's like and you know, utilizing Slack and you know virtual high fives and you know uh, setting up a Slack channel primarily for, for gaming, <laughs> right? So Keeping it fun, keeping it light um, is, is key. But um, communication across the board, super important when it comes to um, releasing software, right? Not just from a product readiness standpoint, as we're gearing up for a release in the coming week, it's, it's very important to keep the business surprised, but making sure that your team is also communicating with the business around changes that you're gonna be implementing in, in your org. Um, super important and make it fun. 
So we okay. actually, Stephen, we have a few questions on that topic um, from that last yeah. slide. So okay. the first one comes from Jake. And Jake is asking, what would be the main value? And I'm not sure actually if this applies for, to that particular slide, but it's what would the main value proposition um, be for having a full sandbox versus a partial sandbox for your final testing before pushing into production? Is it best practice to always have a full sandbox if you aren't doing super heavy code deployments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the best practice is, um, yes, yeah, using a full sandbox, um, yeah, for, for testing primarily, structuring it in such a way where um, you have a, a partial, right, but then a full, a full sandbox and keeping cost in mind, right, because um, they are, they are expensive, but then, um, yeah, doing, doing testing, testing there. Okay, cool. I will respond back to that so that he has it in writing. Next one comes from Shirinavas, and I hope that I said that right, but it's, can we store reference data into version control? The reason I'm asking is because we do frequent sandbox refreshes, and if we have the reference data in the sandbox, mm -hmm. that'll wipe out the refresh. So mm -hmm. if we can store that in the version control system, then we can put it back. Yes, so that's exactly what we're working on. Um, tools we're working on a, a new uh we're working on a suite of tools that that are going to help you accomplish that that very goal um if you're using a repo for for all your metadata management you might want to use that same repo to store your your record data or your reference data right so exactly accounting for the situation that that you you mentioned um but going beyond that being able to track changes to record data in a version control system um is going to be super key so that you can deploy out of that deploy system and you have that full system of record of changes that are being made who made the change when was the change made and all that gets saved as commits um, within the branch that you specify within the within the version control system so perfect and we've got one more but just so that we get that we know we answered your questions let us know in the questions that we answered it or if you have a follow-up we'd love to to know um, but the final question for that was, are there useful tools to automatically test CPQ processes? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I'd be interested in knowing further what, what type of testing you're, you're looking to do on, on CPQ. Um, we're releasing a, um, a new product we call AppOps Test next week that helps admins uh, test and primarily perform regression testing on CPQ business logic. So all the business logic, you, you know, in CPQ primarily around the calculate engine, uh, price rules get stored in the record data. So being able to test if, um, uh, well, beyond just the calculate functions, you know, is the number of quote lines generating, the number of uh, lines I'm expecting, is the net total price being calculated correctly based on my, how I've actually set up um, my environment. So um, we have tools we're focused on releasing um, primarily around that purpose uh, and primarily around the record data, um, so testing the, the core core underlying logic. Um, and if you want to sync up to and, and discuss, I'd, I'd be happy, and um, anyone who's asked a question, um, happy to schedule some time to and understand more what, what you're looking for and what problems you're specifically trying to solve as we release these new products. So. Thank you, Stephen. And we'll, Christian, we'll, we'll reach out to you offline too. I see you have the follow-up, but for time purposes, Stephen, go ahead. Okay, cool. All right, guys, we'll just cruise through a couple, uh, you know, uh, bear in mind. <laughs> uh, making changes directly in the production org, you know, outside of reports and dashboards and you know, email templates. Um, as you look to adopt more of a framework around what changes can be made, uh, your internal change control policies may prohibit you from making changes directly in the production org. Even if you're not changing a field directly or the value in a field, um, if you issue a deployment and it still indicates that that record was you know, last modified by you know, uh, your, your compliance department, you know, might be calling you up because they want that history of, of change control. Um, and just as a general practice with, you know, the production environment being the sanctioned environment, just like a developer would never make changes directly in production, right? Um, it's, it's just important to bear in mind that that's, that is the core, um, that is the core environment that your, that your customers are, 
you know, your stakeholders are in and, and using it. If anything goes down, that's um, uh, that's business impacting. Um, don't push changes without securing proper approval. Yeah, right. Um, no one likes red tape. Uh, no one likes you know multiple layers of approval. But um, just in general practice and guidelines is before a release goes out. Right, getting sign off from the core stakeholders that were involved up front from the very beginning. Right, to make sure everything's uh, the steps have been followed. You've got a checklist. You're checking off the right things, um, and uh, um, just make sure you secure the right right approvals before you. Um, push anything to, to production. Don't discount the importance of a change management system and adopting a version control system. So kind of going back to what we've discussed is um, the production org is not the source of truth, right? The version control system is the source of truth because that's where it tracks all the changes that are being made on an org so that you can still remain agile and declaratively configure and build and test and, and release changes um, while it's all being tracked. So you can meet the business requirements that your, your auditors and your compliance team has around needing to see what changes were made when and who modified them. Um, so super, super key. Um, don't forget to communicate to stakeholders regularly about your release sprints and schedules. Yes, so going back to that, that point around just Transparency, right, around um, just the business, uh, the releases, um, you know, automating emails out to the stakeholders who submitted the change requests, right, specifically with their requirements and letting them know, hey, these requirements are now going out. And even in participating in some early UAT with them, right, that's something we used to do um, uh, back when I was when I was on the admin team is um, uh, meeting with the stakeholders and ensuring like what they actually were implementing or requesting is actually built to spec. And, um, and so transparency, communication always, always a plus. Um, and then don't forget to integrate into existing developer workflows. So yes, you know, admins and developers are both working in the environment and there's different skill sets there that they each can employ and bring to the table to ensure a, a successful release so um, making sure that whatever the admins are doing they're they're being integrated into the flow that the actual developers are actually using as well too so automating as much as you can into the overall process um, leveraging tools like like version control which traditionally you would think is is a developer tool as they're familiar with leveraging but there's no reason why an admin can't can't learn and get familiar with how version control systems work um, and start to leverage those as, as they're becoming increasingly important. Um, so integrating into existing workflows and collaborating with other teams so that there's no silos, right? Um, at, at in contact, we found, you know, the our our management of Salesforce and CPQ touched so many stakeholders, you know, from product to sales to IT, we were always working with different groups, right? So constant communication and collaboration and integrating into um, existing processes and building new processes where they were needed um, to ensure things are working. So okay. we've got another quick question here though from Luke, which is really interesting. Um, he's asking, should there be seniority between devs and admins? That's interesting. Um, and he's got a follow up. Should admins <laughs> bow down to devs? <laughs> he's no. heavily configured. That's interesting. You know, I, I mean, no, I don't think there, I mean, senior, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's, there's different skill sets, right? Um, admins come to the table with immense knowledge of how to build uh, on the, on the Salesforce platform based on the, the guidelines and, and, and what Salesforce provides. Um, so you can make changes faster. Developers you know, might be well versed in Apex, right? And then they can implement their own set of changes. So I don't think it's one rolling up to the other. Um, it's more of it's collaboration for sure. And as as admins start to take on more role and and um, uh, in implementing changes that say a developer would traditionally have implemented, it's beneficial for both sides, right? The developer can still work and deliver value to the business um, and the admin can develop and, or, uh, and deliver value to the business too because now they're 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 doing now declaratively what developers used to do uh, through 
through code. Um, and the two can work very much together um, to implement a successful, uh, a successful project. Um, case and example, um, when we implemented CPQ, uh, we were the admins, right? We, were, we, weren't, we weren't coding anything, but we had to engage heavily with our developer team where we had requirements that were outside the scope of our, of our skill set. Right, so we were writing up requirements documents. We were working with the stakeholders to ensure, you know, we're going to be moving our entire quoting system into CPQ. So we're capturing the requirements that were needed. And as we were going through, there were things that we ran into that we just we couldn't do without the help of the IT group and and the uh, and the developers. So um, had those relationships in place. So we we worked directly within the IT sprints to ensure that we were promoting up the requirements we were getting from the business and the developers were, were helping us deliver on the, the requirements so we had a successful project. So. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to talk about um, agile release management for low code apps. So, so we've talked about uh, release management frameworks and software development, how they translate into a Salesforce workflow, how admins can start taking uh, ownership and start um, uh, contributing to this overall process and workflow. Now, there's challenges. There's challenges that are present um, and there's problems that arise. So even though Salesforce is highly configurable, customizable, you are gonna find that some apps um, don't store data as, as metadata. Um, and the admin needs to be involved in the process of promoting changes from an environment to another environment. Think of um, uh, what developers used to have to do, right? The developer used to be responsible for uh, deploying the changes to code from, from an environment to an environment. Um, and now that role has slowly shifted to, to the admins, right? Both freeing up the developer's time and and giving the admins a new skill set to work with, but also because they can do things so quickly on the Salesforce platform. Now, apps like CPQ, like B2B and Field Service Lightning store the data as record data. So you're gonna need the right tools to be able to iterate fast and deliver and promote that data from an environment to another environment or your production org, um, specifically centered around reference data um, so that you can treat reference data, configuration data with the same right, the same amount of rigor as, as metadata and, and code. Um, and that's where uh, probably AppOps as a solution has really been designed to equip admins with that tool set so that they can help their business deploy these changes fast from an invite from uh, from sandbox to to uh, to production. Um, who's familiar with this? this problem. Um, if you're an admin, uh, you know, change sets don't deploy record data. Um, and have you used data loader and spreadsheets to, to deploy complex relationships into your production org? Right? Working with spreadsheets and trying to map ID relationships only to find that IDs change in, in the destination org? So if you ever encountered that that problem, I remember when I was an admin, like it's like, um, yeah, record, uh, you know, duplication is a nightmare, right? Since Salesforce being a system of record, you're dealing it's a record management system, and uh, duplicated data is a nightmare. So um, probably AppOps and AppOps release helps provide you with the tools to automate that workflow so you don't have to be as concerned with the remapping of the relationships, the schemas of the objects, um, and be as concerned with the changing IDs um, from, from an org to an org so that you can deploy the record data from, uh, from your sandbox and promote it up through the different environments and, and be assured that the data is deployed to to a production org and save you the most amount of time. So what would take, you know, hours and hours and hours doing it through spreadsheets and data loader, you can do through um, doing minutes and, um, and make that process process easier for you. Um, and that's where, um, you know, as we look ahead into 2020 and, and even beyond, um, I mentioned at the beginning, our, our focus is, is making the experience um, 
easier for the admin, right? Because the admin is is a critical component, uh, critical stakeholder in in your overall release management um, cycle. Uh, so our vision is to provide the tools uh, for the admins and for the end users so that they can build, test, make sure that the the data is being developed, configured correctly to spec, um, released using a source control system so that you can track changes, uh, maintain internal compliance, um, and then and then analyze uh, analyze the data. So you have um, change performance analytics and, and compliance um, so that ultimately you can you can deliver more value to your business and you can deliver faster um, and remain agile in, in this environment where um, uh, just mandates that that you that you move faster and, and remain compliant. Um, so, with that, I think we. Tori, did you want to cover this one or? Sure, we absolutely can. Um, yeah. I have some here. These are basically um, our tips and tricks. This is the playbook to getting started for Agile release. Stephen and I have been working on this. Uh, for a while, and he can go over and explain specifically what's on here. But basically, it's a guide to help you guys get set up with a general agile release management process of what that looks like, who you should talk to, what you need to be aware of, and all the ins and outs there. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And all of you guys will be getting that handout too. <laughs> Okay, so I'll get back on camera so you guys can see my lovely face. But wait, I just turn on my thing. So if you guys did enjoy this webinar today, we will get started with our Q and A. You'll have time to ask more questions here in just a minute. I just want to cover some more information with you guys since we did have some questions about CPQ. So Christian, this might be a great uh, webinar for you. We at Proudly have a lot of experts uh, just on our staff, people who have come to us from Salesforce or from other big companies. Uh, and this particular session that we're doing was Derek Black's presentation at Dreamforce. Uh, so it's our CPQ gotchas and best practices. He covers everything from implementation or from planning to implementation. Um, he's worked with big machines, uh, Oracle, Steelbrick, anything CPQ, anything quote to cash. So he is truly an expert in this field, and we're we're very excited that he's doing this presentation on April 21st at 10 a.m. again. So that's on our website. We'll also send you a link to it if you're interested in signing up for it. Um, and if any of you guys do want to learn a little bit more about our AppOps products, what those look like, how they would work for you, uh, you can either go to our App Exchange listing G2 to see the reviews, see what other customers are saying, um, or you can go ahead and schedule a demo with us. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love for you uh, to show you exactly how this would work in your environment and what that can do for your business. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. As I said before, you guys are going to be getting a recording, you're going to be getting that checklist, and you're going to be getting these slides. Um, but with that, we'll go ahead to the Q&A because we've got about 12 minutes left. So if there's anything else that you guys want to ask, you have any questions about how this process works, another thing for us too is if you have done any of those don'ts in your life that we had went over as best practices, we'd love to hear those too. Get those horror stories out um, just because we'd love to either do uh, a feature on you or something along those lines so let us know but this is your time uh, if there's no other questions you guys get about 10 minutes back to your day okay so we are getting some questions which is awesome uh first one comes from jeremy so he's asking what's your advice on encouraging slash forcing compliance to an agile process which is great we have attempted many times to implement, but our main developer is the CEO and owner, and he tends to do what he wants instead of staying in the system. So I think it's more of how to sell the stakeholder, how to sell those leaders on doing this process. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, uh, a lot of follow-up questions as to how, you know, how, how your setup is implemented. Um, but I mean, in general, um, I think it's selling selling him on the importance right of what could go wrong 
right? If anything were to happen in your production environment um, and providing clear examples to him, I, I don't know what your, your specific implementation looks like or it's highly customized, um, but I mean, how many people you have using, you know, Salesforce? I mean, think of think of what could potentially go wrong if anything were to occur with a faulty deployment, um, uh, or just not having the right change management controls in place. Um, how many users could be impacted? Um, and then and then really trying to sell to him that um, hey, there there has to be processes in place, not to add red tape, but just to um, just encourage. Uh, uh, just encourage, you know, proper proper development on on the Salesforce platform, and um, just ensure that you you can keep the business running right, which is a critical, especially now in, in this in this time. You got to keep the engines running, and um, having processes in place where everyone's involved and collaborating and signing off on on requirements and change requests um, are going to be are going to be critical. If I understood your question, I didn't know if you if you had specific. Uh, governance or compliance related questions maybe uh, you were looking to have answered but um, now yeah, I'll hope that helped so perfect uh, Luke is asking a question about our product actually so he wants to know can our product work side by side with git um, or is it recommended to use one or the other hmm okay yeah so we have um, we have a DX plugin um, so we can enter we can um, uh, you can install our DX plugin, and you can and you can write you pass in parameters directly into our plugin, so you can initiate deployments of record data to um, you know from org to org. You could also store that record data in in a Git repository. Um, but we are building the tools that make it easy to declaratively do that through our through our app. Um, so you'd be able to check in changes to an org um, uh, and uh, check in the changes made to record data on, on objects, check them into a version control system um, where they'll exist there as, as commits, um, and then deploy out of that version control system so that you have the system of record. Um, and then eventually the goal would be to open that up through APIs. So you could either do it through the app, but or you could also write your own scripts and integrate directly through these APIs to start automating a lot of those workflows for check-ins and deployments um, specifically around the configuration data um, so hope that hope that helped i think that's perfect the next question is actually for me um, and mel is asking if we have any proudly certification trainings coming up so mel we've actually changed that program quite a bit so the certification trainings are now partner specific so if you are one of our partners you can reach out to Susie Wallingford, who is our, our partner alliances director. Um, but if you're a customer, what we have are these one-on-one -on -one small trainings now where you can meet with your uh, customer success manager and they can actually set up a training for you and your team so that you do get that hands-on training, you have that onboarding experience, and you're actually using that product, uh, our product correctly. <laughs> so um, we don't have the trainings anymore specifically for our you know, our people who are looking at our products and things like that. It's really for our customers and for our um, partners. However, we have a lot of other webinars, any other information that you're needing. If you want to look at the product more closely, uh, perfect, Mel, you're an independent consultant. So go ahead and reach out to Susie. She'll help you set you up there and get you the link to that. Um, now, Deep is asking a question for you, Stephen, this time. <laughs> How do you change the focus from diving into the project before understanding the full scope of the business case? Our org is very uh, technology driven, which isn't really thought through for end use end user functionality for streamlined processes. Hmm. Okay. Um, can, you want, can you read that one back to me one more time, Tori? Absolutely. So how do you change the focus from diving into the project before understanding the full scope of the business case? Um, Diva's org is really very technologically driven, uh, which isn't really thought through for end user functionality for streamlined processes. Hmm. What type of org um, are you using, Deepa? So you're using you're using an org that 
I'm trying to understand, are you, you're developing in, in a specific org um, or in your, or maybe, um, maybe you could recap for me what, what the, what's the specific challenge that you're, that you're running into as far as, um, on with Estiva. Yep, here we go. So she says, when a project comes to the table, the first thought is how to program the solution. Hmm. Okay. And and uh, the projects are coming to the table. Uh, how are those those requests coming in? I can, uh, she also I can, says, instead of how the best solution, Salesforce tickets. Okay, they're coming in as Salesforce tickets. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I'm happy to um, like uh, schedule a call with with Deepa to understand more as to. Um, so, it was just being a product manager, right, and thinking it in terms of um, how I would work it. Um, requests come in from you know, customers, they come from internal stakeholders, right, through a variety of means, ideas, feature requests, they come to me directly, right? So um, I'll just speak in terms of my experience. Hopefully it helps you and um, let me know if it doesn't or if you want to set up some time, we can discuss too. Um, but uh, so requests come in, right? There's a backlog of the requests as they come in, right? There's features from you know, all, all over the map, right? And and then it's my job to actually start identifying and triaging, okay, what's the priority and what's the business impact? What's the value? I start breaking it down, organizing the list, um, start scheduling calls with the stakeholders or the customers to understand really what the business problems are because sometimes what's captured in tickets isn't really either a solution will be proposed or the problem that's being addressed really isn't really isn't the problem, right? It might be some other type of problem because what ultimately they're trying to get at is they want a feature to be built into the actual software. Um, so meeting with the customer and understanding really what's going on, what problem they're having, doing some basic journey mapping to understand where they're blocked, right? Where the bottlenecks are, what's the biggest pain point? And then I can take that information and then start writing up a spec or a story then I can use with my development team. And we use JIRA as our tracking system. So I'd write up a story or I'd write up an epic for the overall feature itself. We'd break down stories, which take that epic and start breaking it down, decomposing it. So it's much more manageable and then start assessing, okay, the impact is X, the effort is gonna be Y, where does it actually fit on the scale of things we have in flight we're working on versus our backlog? Once it's prioritized into the sprint, we'll, we'll work it. And then it's my job to communicate that with the rest of the, the business and then um, plan the feature that's going to be released into the actual um, uh, release or the, the, uh, the package that we ultimately release. So it could be two sprints, three sprints, four sprints, however it longs to actually implement that particular epic or that feature. Um, and then, and then ultimately deliver it to, to the soft, uh, to the, um, to the customer. And then, you know, if it's a beta, then we'll follow up to understand if, you know, did we, you know, deliver the the requirements as is initially, is it solving the original problem that you had brought to our attention? Um, and then, and then ongoing some beta testing and uh, with them to understand maybe some UX or usability. Um, and then. Uh, and then it's agile, right? So we, we captured the additional requests if we have to iterate on that particular feature that we built and we take it through the exact same process. Um, so Diva says, Diva says that your process is very logical for companies to change their culture regarding the approach to projects, which is uh -huh. something that I think we hear a lot. Yeah. Um, if you do need help with that, we're gonna have some sessions about how to talk to stakeholders or you know, you can call us up. We'll we'll handle that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Are there any other questions? We got one minute left, so you can type quickly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Well, if there are no more questions, we'll give you just a couple of minutes to go ahead. We'll stay on the line for maybe another 30 seconds or so, let you guys type those in. Um, again, thank you so much for spending this hour with us. We hope you learned a lot. We hope that um, you have a great day, Mel. <laughs> we hope that you learned a lot. We hope you got a lot of resources. We'll be sure to send you this recording as well as the slide deck and that checklist to help you with all of your future Agile release management needs. Um, with that, thank you all so much and hopefully we we'll see you soon. Bye all.